thoughts about JavaScript, and I'm going to talk about JavaScript eventually, but first, I would like to talk about English, and not English as we know it, but Old English. Um, it would be unrecognizable to you or me in written form or in spoken form, but it came from the same language family as Dutch and German and Icelandic, and if things had gone differently, modern English would, would resemble those languages much more closely. Uh, but in the 11th century, William II decided he wanted to be king of England, so he gathered an army in Normandy, and he, evaded, he invaded the country across the Channel, and he won. And many of those who had fought in his army were rewarded with land and power, and they became the new ruling class in England. Uh, and they brought with them a dialect of Old French that had a lasting influence on English vocabulary. As Old English evolved into Middle English, large numbers of French loan words found their way into the language. And over the next few centuries, as Middle English became Modern English, the language borrowed more and more words, mainly from classical sources. Um, the translation of theological texts from Latin revealed gaps in English vocabulary, and the simplest solution was to adopt the Latin word into English. But there were people who decried what they saw as a bastardization of the English tongue, and they, they called these new words inkhorn terms. Um, an inkhorn being a kind of inkwell and so, you know, a marker of a snobbish writer. And instead of using these borrowed words, they would try to resurrect archaic words um, from English that had fallen out of favor, or they would try to invent new words from Germanic roots. But these words usually didn't catch on. Um, a classical scholar named John Cheek was one of the most vocal critics of inkhorn terms. Um, and because he's speaking in metaphor here, it's not entirely clear to me what he thinks will actually happen if the worst case comes to pass. But nearly 500 years later, we can see that English has not declared bankruptcy by any means. And the way I know this is that Cheek is writing in early modern English, yet we can all read and understand his words with very little difficulty, save for the creative spelling. Um, but even at the time, the purists were in the minority. Uh, George Petty sums up the rebuttal here. Uh, he says that the purists apply the label inkhorn term inconsistently and only for the words that they don't like. Uh, he says that half the words in English are borrowed from somewhere and only the new borrowings get scrutinized because their novelty makes them seem strange. Uh, he says that borrowing is healthy for a language, but more than that, it's unavoidable. It's something that all languages do. I know not how we should speak anything without blacking our mouths with ink. So linguistic purism lost the battle for English, and we now know that their worries were largely overblown. But for fun's sake, there are some small corners of the English-speaking world who practice what's called Anglish, which is um, English with as few borrowed words as possible, remaining true to its Anglo-Saxon roots. Um, it's like an alternative history sort of linguistics. What if the Normans hadn't conquered England? What might our language sound like? Uh, there's a, a wiki for English, of course, and it's called the English mut, a mut being an old word for a discussion, and the word that they've decided to use to replace wiki being of Hawaiian origin. Um, and so we can go there to learn some things about our own country. In English, the United States of America would be the banded folkdoms of America's land. Um, <laughs> And you could learn that, that the BFA emerged from 13 British Reichlings who drafted an acknowledged hood of selfdom in 1776. You would learn that the leader of America's land is four-sitter Barack Obama of the Folk Reich Mutt Band, um, which is way cooler sounding than, than Democratic Party. Four-sitter sounds like he should be like, like on a horse or something. Uh, but like, do you see how ridiculous this gets and how quickly? Um, Many years ago, we had lexical purists in English, and they lost. They lost in part because they were warning of a vague, nonspecific doom that would come from, from these evil new words. But the only thing that offended them about the words was the alien origin. They weren't arguing that the words were unclear or that they couldn't be used well. They didn't like the new words because they were new. Um, so now I'd like to talk about French. Um, French is different, obviously. It dates back to uh, Julius Caesar's conquest of Gaul in the first century BC, so it's derived mainly from Latin. But along the way, French took a different path. In 1634, Cardinal Richelieu created a body called l'Académie Française, dedicated to the, the purification and preservation of French. Whereas 
England had largely ignored John Cheek and the other doomsayers, there was one hugely influential Frenchman who declared that it was worth it to protect his language from the influence of other languages. Uh, the academy still exists today. The French government declares the official authority on the French language. Uh, there's no equivalent body for English. There are people who release dictionaries and people who write grammar books, but no one who claims to be an authority for all the English spoken and written throughout the world. There are 40 seats in the academy, and members hold their seat until they die or step down, at which time the other members vote on a replacement. They have uniforms. You are looking at the ceremonial uniform of the members of the academy. You can see they take this very seriously. Um, and they, they publish the official dictionary of the French language. Um, and they have another function that opens them up to ridicule. They try to prevent the adoption of loan words. English language culture is worldwide, and our words worm their way into other languages, just as Latin words once wormed their way into ours. And the academy tries to keep French harmonious by providing French-derived equivalents to English loan words. This isn't much different from the, the efforts of English's linguistic purists, except that in French, these efforts are blessed by the government. But the academy lacks any sort of enforcement mechanism, even within the government. So in practice, many of these recommendations are ignored by French speakers. Um, in January, France, France's General Commission of Terminology and Neologisms um, announced that use of the word hashtag is discouraged among francophones. And the preferred term is mot dièse, which literally means sharp word, uh, as in the sharp symbol from musical notation. Um, I'm going to try to make all of this relevant to where we are today with our, with our own language. Um, I've not yet decided which of these models is better for describing how programming languages evolve. Uh, on one hand, they have to be understood by machines. And the best way to make sure all machines understand a language the same way is to be very specific about how the language is designed. So we need a top-down approach. We need a standards body. On the other hand, Standards bodies don't typically try to specify style. Our coding styles aren't shaped by the ECMAScript spec. They're shaped by the code we've read out there in the real world. Code patterns are folk-driven solutions to common problems. So we also need a robust community in which people are writing their own code and reading the code of others. Uh, after years of minimal change, JavaScript is evolving. ES5 intentionally did not introduce new syntax. So ES6 is the first time in over a decade that JavaScript is poised to adopt new syntax. This is going to feel weird. It must feel weird because new syntax has to be declared from on high. Um, some of the new features are controversial, and some of them are not. And as far as I can tell, nearly all the uncontroversial things are the ones that add new features, maps, weak maps, weak maps proxies, um, and so on. And in browsers now, we've got typed arrays in support of WebGL and the other APIs that, that let us manipulate binary data. And the concept of a typed array is quite foreign to how JavaScript usually works. But I've never seen arg anyone argue that typed arrays shouldn't be in JavaScript because they were necessary to do the things we wanted to do. Whereas to me, most of the controversial things are the things that merely restate what we can already do. Some of the new syntax is trying to replace patterns that individual JavaScripters have come up with. Uh, the existing patterns are a bit clumsy and they don't look quite as nice, but we invented them ourselves. And so it feels strange to have something come out to replace all that work. It feels like L'Académie Française is telling us not to use the words that we came up with ourselves. Um, so the best example might be the proposal for uh, what, what's called maximally minimal classes. They're called maximally minimal because the, pro, the proposed syntax is a very tiny evolution over how people make classes in existing JavaScript. Uh, you can see the existing syntax on the left and the proposed syntax on the right. They are functionally equivalent. No new features are introduced. There's no confusing new semantics. There's no gotchas. This is shortcut syntax. It doesn't replace prototypal inheritance. It's just a restatement of prototypal inheritance. Under, under the hood, it's nothing but prototypes. 
Uh, in theory, this is about as unthreatening as Newsom tax is going to get. It is, there are a couple new keywords that are introduced, but they're words that were reserved by JavaScript years ago. And if we don't use them, they're just going to go to waste. And the door is open for the syntax to be extended in the future. Um, right now, there's no built-in way to do class methods, but a future version of ECMAScript could introduce class methods through new syntax without breaking backward compatibility. Um, but I hear rebuttals. There are, there are a number of reasons that you can be against the, the class's proposal, but the, re the one that I read the most is the one that makes the least sense to me. Um, Class-based inheritance is a JavaScript pattern that has existed for years. It's a subset of prototypal inheritance, and I know that because we've been using prototypal inheritance to emulate class-based inheritance. The straw man used uh, 3.js as the example, but you can look at uh, Backbone or jQuery UI or a half dozen frameworks that everyone in this room has used. And we can talk about whether it's a good pattern on the merits, but it drives me nuts when I see simplistic opposition based on one person's subjective idea of what JavaScript is and isn't. And even if you think uh, that classes aren't real JavaScript, opposing this syntax isn't going to make them go away. They already exist in half of your favorite libraries. Um, the most common rebuttal I see is from people who can't disentangle the idea of classes from Java. They see the word class and they get shell shock and flash back to some horrible internship where they had to spend all day in Eclipse writing getter and setter methods. <laughs> um, so yeah, clearly this is the thing I was clearly working up to. This is, but this isn't just about classes. Um, but classes are the best example. If you say classes will turn JavaScript into Java, you are a modern day John Cheek. You're attacking the new words because they come from a different language that you don't like. JavaScript is not Java, and it won't turn into Java just because we add syntax for the classes that people are already writing. The status quo of JavaScript, the language that the purists are trying to protect, is a language that has already borrowed half of its syntax from Java and um, a handful of Java's features, and that's how it's it'll continue to work. Um, default parameters are coming. They already exist in a bunch of other languages. Uh, array comprehensions and generators are coming over from Python. ES6 is not, going, is not inventing new things out of thin air. Uh, it's taking things that have worked in other languages and applying them to our own. We are going to black our mouths with ink no matter what we do. Um, so here's the problem. Um, Introducing new syntax to JavaScript is going to be hard for the same reason that L'Academie Francaise has trouble getting people to use their words. Um, we're going to have new syntax for classes and modules, but in our, word, in our world, we already have several different ways of doing classical inheritance and several different ways of modularizing code. Um, and it reminds me of something else that's happening in English. When you want to refer to some person who is hypothetical or whose gender you don't know, you've got a few options. Um, older grammar books will tell you that uh, the third person singular masculine can be used to refer to a person of indeterminate gender. But this is, this is falling out of favor. Um, it can be semantically awkward and there are people who think it perpetuates thinking of men as the default and women as a special case. So um, some people have taken it upon themselves to invent a new, a new gender neutral pronoun for English. Um, a mathematician named Michael Spivak popularized the idea of taking the third person plurals, them, they, and their, and dropping the th to turn each one into a gender neutral singular, um, which is pretty simple and arguably pretty elegant, but the practice has not caught on. Um, instead, what's caught on is to is uh, either to say he or she in each instance, or more commonly to use what's called the singular they, um, to, re to repurpose third person plural as third person singular. Um, it's not hard to argue that singular they is not 
the most well-designed solution, but that's the thing. It didn't win because it was elegant. It won because it's the solution that is most familiar to English speakers and because it doesn't require the teaching of an entirely new word. The singular they usage was able to spread organically through popular use. Um, and to bring us back to JavaScript, I think we overlook that. Um, that even though JavaScript is written for machines to understand, um, every line of JavaScript that's written adds to a giant corpus of code that other people can read. You probably learned English from a grammar book or a textbook, but you became an expert at English through reading books and watching movies and talking to people around you in English. Um, likewise, you may have learned how to code from a book, but you develop your coding skills by reading the code of those around you. Um, if I were trying to introduce a new word into English, I would try to, to convince a high-profile source to start using it. I would get it into dictionaries. I, I would make it part of Associated Press uh, style. I'd get a major news outlet to use regularly. Um, Time, Mag Time Magazine spent most of the 20th century trying to coin new words of their own, and they, they had more misses than hits, but they're credited with inventing words like socialite and, uh, and televangelist. Um, so it helps to have major firepower behind new words, but it's, it's no guarantee that they'll catch on. Um, ideally, people realize that the new word represents something that deserves to have a name, and they start to use it before they have time to come up with something else. But that's a lot of maybes, and if it doesn't quite work out, then um, you end up looking like an idiot, um, you know, uh, using this, this new word that you've invented that no one understands what it means. Um, so if the people in this room wield any influence, um, and I, I think they do, then we're going to be an important part of what happens when ES6 is final. If you don't like some of the new stuff, that's fine. You can pretend it doesn't exist. Uh, you're not obligated to do anything. But if you like the new class syntax or the new module syntax or destructuring or block scope or whatever, then you can do some simple things to help them along. Uh, you can write documentation. Um, MDN is probably going to have this covered. But it's, it's not just the reference documentation. It's blog posts. It's Stack Overflow, uh, tutorials, code recipes, anything like that. No matter how, triv no matter how trivial you think it is, because a lot of this will be brand new to um, a lot of developers, and they're going to Google it, and there should be content there. Um, if you're in an environment that, that will get new syntax quickly, like Node, then you don't have much of an excuse not to, uh, to be the syntactic change that you want to see. Um, if you write for the browser, it's not as easy. But um, once ES6 is finalized, I hope we can come together around a canonical transpiler that will, um, that will let us all write ES6 or some reasonable subset of ES6 and get it transpiled over to ES3 for environments that need it. Um, and hopefully this will be in a near future when all browsers support source maps so that we can do it as painlessly as possible. Um, but here's the most important part. Uh, be a therapist. People fear change. We hang around and we talk about this stuff at conferences and on mailing lists, on Twitter. Um, and it's old stuff to us. But when it's unveiled to the rest of the world, there's going to be a backlash. To many people, it's going to seem jarring and strange. Here, they just learned JavaScript a couple years ago. And right as they thought they were getting the hang of it, there's this new scary thing that reminds them of the Java world that they left behind. I want you to hug them tightly and whisper, it's not your fault. <laughs> over and over again. Tell them it's going to be OK. Tell them they don't have to be scared by new, modest, and optional enhancements. It's still going to look and feel like JavaScript. And the next time that you worry about where JavaScript is going, remember that 500 years later, we can still read the words of John Cheek. The language you love is not going anywhere. And I think I came in uh, just under time. So that's all for me.